ESPN News Special Report. Good to you. I'm Ben Bradley. Let's head downtown where Mayor Lightfoot is joined by Chicago Police Brass and Congressman Bobby Rush to make an announcement. Uh, today. Congressman Bobby Rush, who yesterday brought to my attention some information that shocked me, shocked my team, and that, frankly, enraged us. But this has only deepened our resolve in this moment. Now, I'll let the congressman uh, detail this particular situation, and then I will speak to it. I want to thank the congressman for being here and for his incredible generosity in this moment. Now, we haven't always agreed on every issue, but today we are in total alignment in our righteous anger and our steadfast determination. And I want to make sure that that's very clear. What I know of Congressman Rush is this. He has committed his life to calling out and fighting against injustice. And as this presents exactly one of those moments. And Congressman, I want to personally thank you. And I commit to being your partner and making sure that we move forward together and use this moment as an opportunity to speak hard truths, to heal what is broken in our city, and that we join you on your lifelong fight for justice, and particularly for black and brown people in our city. We have a moment to make a huge difference, and we're going to seize this moment aggressively and move forward in partnership with you and the thousands of others across our city who are demanding justice and are seeing this moment as an opportunity to right the wrongs of the past. I'm going to ask Congressman Rush to um, come to the podium and describe uh, what happened, and then I will come back to the podium. Congressman. Thank you, Mayor Lightfoot. Let me begin by saying some two years ago, I did not give this mayor the benefit of the doubt. Today I stand here without any doubt, any doubt, any doubt in my heart, in my mind, and in my spirit that she is absolutely committed to the well-being of all Chicagoans, bar none. I have watched her on local news, local commentaries. I have watched her on national news. As late as yesterday, I watched her on Morning Joe. And this mayor gets it. She speaks and provides a voice to all those who have no voice, who live lives of mostly quiet desperation, but sometimes demonstrated desperation. She is, has a heart for the city, a heart for the black and brown communities, a heart for those who own the margins of our society, a heart for those who are downtrodden, and a heart for those who are sinking the way out. This is the Earl of Lori Lightfoot, and I intend to do all that I can within all my capabilities to make this era of Laura Lightfoot the absolutely best era that this city has seen. She is, has been a reconciler 
of the many differences that she didn't create, but she has the capacity to resolve, the strength and the courage to correct. And I want you to know that, again, I'm so proud of her leadership, her voice, her understanding. Two weeks ago, on a Sunday, I got a, on a Sunday evening, early Monday morning, I got a call that my campaign officers at 55th and South Wentworth had been burglarized, and that <clears throat> my district director had a videotape of eight or more police officers lounging in my office as what I assume looters were bringing in stores in this shopping center where my office is located at. We looked at the videotape and we saw eight or more police officers, including three white shirts, in repose, relaxing during these most difficult times. And they had their feet up on the desk. One was asleep on my couch in my, at my campaign office. One had his head down on the desk. One was on his cell phone. They even had the unmitigated gall to go and make coffee for themselves and to pop popcorn, my popcorn, in my microwave while looters were tearing apart businesses within their sight, within their reach. They were in a mood of, re of relaxation, and they did not care about what was happening to business people, to the, this city. They didn't care. They absolutely didn't care. I talked to a call Alderman Dow on last weekend and asked her would she contact the mayor, tell the mayor that I have a video of these police officers in their mis or no conduct, lack of conduct, and I wanted to share that with her. I am so amazed, so thankful that it didn't take four hours since I talked to Old McDowell that the mayor was on the phone calling me, asking me, can I come down to City Hall? I told her that I, was, I had some obligation at my church. She said, well, what time do they in? I said, well, they end at, from, at 7 o'clock. Can you be here at 7.30? Last night at 7.30, I showed up here at City Hall. The mayor waiting for me. The police superintendent waiting for me. She wanted to view this videotape. I was absolutely, I am absolutely amazed at her response, how she takes it personally that these police officers, while on duty, in uniform, white shirts and mob, how they took such a lackadaisical attitude, a non-caring attitude, violating my personal space while looting was occurring all around them. They didn't care. But I stand here to salute our great mayor because although the policemen in that office in repose in relaxation, didn't care, our mayor cared. 
she did care. And I'm so glad to be here this afternoon, standing with a mayor who cares. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Congressman, for your incredibly powerful words. And let me lead by apologizing to you again. On behalf of our city, that you and your office were treated with such profound disrespect. That's a personal embarrassment to me. And I'm sorry that you and your ha staff even had to deal with this incredible indignity. I just spoke a moment ago about injustice. And it manifests itself in many obvious, but also subtle and insidious ways. Of course, when a black man dies in the street with a white police officer's knee on his neck. It is murder, but it's also profoundly unjust. And we can have no tolerance for that ever, and people are rightly outraged. But equally unacceptable is when there is looting and brazen criminal conduct, also unjust. And it really is the height of injustice when police are deployed, given a mission, and they fail to act. That, too, is injustice. Public safety cannot be a commodity that is only available to the wealthy and connected. Public safety must be a reality everywhere, everywhere, in every neighborhood, of our city, period. When you swear an oath to serve and protect, you are a Chicago police officer, not a police officer for only certain neighborhoods and only at certain times. That is not how it is or will ever be in our city. Now, you've all seen me angry unfortunately, a lot lately. I was and I still am angry at the murder of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, of Ahmaud Arbery, and way too many others. And I was angry when looters hijacked righteous protesters and targeted black communities. I was angry and concerned when black and Latinx tension threatened to tear apart our city just at a time when we needed to stand united. And I'm angry today. As a black woman, we are often told, don't show your rage. Don't let them paint you as another angry black woman. Don't scold. Don't curse. Keep it together. Be respectable and presentable. Now, my life in this country has forced me to be angry and determined to be a fighter all my life. I have fought with every fiber of my being. To survive in a world that was built to throw flaming roadblocks in our way as black people. And I am working every day to instill that fight and that determination in my black daughter and show her that even, yes, we have a responsibility to live our full and authentic lives, even in the face of these deeply ingrained and innately violent systems of racism. And if we're angry, let's not shrink from that, but let's use our anger to get results. And what I'm also feeling in this moment is incredible resolve. I do have a range of emotions as I stand here, but mostly I'm done. We cannot go on like this anymore. 
Look, we don't paint all police officers with a broad brush. That would be wrong. And I spent a lot of time, and a lot of time being criticized for it, for praising our officers for their hard work, for their restraint, for de-escalation in the vast majority of cases over the recent weeks of unrest and protest. Those men and women are the heroes, and they have served the city honorably, and they represent the badge proudly. But the officers in this incident and others we've seen in the past weeks, Jack, if we can show like this, have demonstrated a total disregard for their colleagues, for the badge, and for those they were sworn to serve and protect. And these officers will be held accountable. This will be investigated thoroughly. That's what we have Chief Kono of IAD here and Sidney Roberts of the Office of Civilian, uh, Civilian Office of Police Accountability. This will be investigated thoroughly and these officers and the supervisors will be identified and they will be held to account. And I can tell you one thing for certain. Not one of these officers will be allowed to hide behind the badge and go on and act like nothing ever happened. Not anymore. Not in my city, not in your city. I was elected on a pledge to ensure transparency and accountability in all things, and particularly with the Chicago Police Department. We know we have a difficult and painful history in our city around delaying the release of videos depicting police misconduct. That is in part why we're showing you these images here today, less than 24 hours after I first laid eyes on them. What they show regrettably is that these individuals were lounging in a congressman's office, having a little hangout for themselves while small businesses on the south side were looted and burned, while their colleagues were getting bottles thrown at their heads and doing everything they could to protect these communities. And perhaps what is most harmful about this is that for so many people on the south and the west side, the actions of these officers, the deplorable lack of responsibility to do their job at a time when the city and their fellow officers needed them most, their conduct will confirm the perception that too many people on the south and the west side were left to fend for themselves that police don't care if black and brown communities were looted and burned. And while thousands of officers served honorably on that very difficult weekend and every day since, these individuals did indeed abandon their responsibilities and their obligation and their oath to serve and protect. We should all be disgusted, and we should all feel hurt and betrayed in this moment of all moments. But let's also not lose sight of the opportunity that this presents. This is a moment to be bold. And if we don't harness this moment to rethink what serving and protecting means, we will never do it this moment presents us with an opportunity not to nibble around the edges, but to be bold. We're already working every day to implement the requirements of the consent decree, but that's not enough. But now, in this moment, it's time for us to fully implement the recommendations of the Police Accountability Task Force more than four years ago that have languished. Now is the moment to be honest about the ways in which the Fraternal Order of Police contract has been holding back the necessary change and reform that we must bring to make this police department fully accountable to the residents of this city. 
And now is the time to act on licensing for police officers once and for all. I'm here to tell you today that I have directed my legal team to do the research and to draft the legislation. I am ready, I am ready to work with the governor and our other great partners in Springfield to forge a change in state law to require licensing and certification of police officers. And I'm grateful for the attendance of Brad Cole, the leader of the Illinois Municipal League, and we will work together to make sure that we get this legislation passed. It's time, really, actually, it's way past time for this change in our state. And licensing is just one of several new measures that we must institute to make individual officers and departments far more accountable to the people. We have a long road and a hard road ahead. And none of these things is going to happen overnight. But I am grateful to have such a principled, focused partner in Superintendent Brown. He gets it. He's not afraid, and neither am I. And together, we want to be clear. You're not serving or protecting anybody when you're shouting a derogatory slur or gesture at them. You're not serving or protecting when you pull people by their, out of their cars, by their hair, and beat the daylights out of them in the street. You're not serving or protecting when you make movie popcorn and put up your feet and lounge while your fellow officers are down the street getting the hell beaten out of them and doing what they swore on earth to do. So today, yes, we are angry, but we're also resolved and we are committed. And we may not be perfect in all of our efforts from this moment forward, but we were seizing on this moment to finally make the changes that many thought were too politically sensitive or infeasible, or too big or too bold. The time for excuses is over. Our people are impatient, and rightfully so. I want to thank again the Congressman for his generosity, generosity of heart, for his lifelong journey to root out injustice, and I commit to being his partner in this quest. And with that, I'd like to ask Superintendent Brown to come to the podium. Thank you, Mayor. And let, let me echo the Mayor's sentiment to Congressman Rush. Thank you so much. <laughs> and a personal apology to you for the actions of these officers from me. Let me start by sharing my comments with our commanders earlier this morning regarding this incident. I started out by saying what I truly believe is universally true in policing and beyond. That behavior reflects leadership. Always. It's a hard truth to take when you're a leader. That you're responsible for the behavior of others. And we, we had an exchange about consequences for this type of behavior that we've seen, not just what happened at the congressman's office, but the other behavior, you know, the officers giving the finger, homophobic slurs, excessive force. That behavior reflects our leadership. Officers asleep during a riot with supervisors in tow reflects our leadership. A few commanders I had to cut off because they began talking about us being too harsh. And when he said us, I said, you mean me being too harsh by relieving officers of their police powers. My rebuttal was it's time for you to stop talking. Our words are cheap when we defend officers for their misconduct. That the integrity of the Chicago Police Department 
is far more important than any individual's officer's friendship with you or family relationship with you. Our integrity to the residents of Chicago is our number one, two, and three priority. That we are in a seminal moment that we have to reveal our leadership. If that means strict discipline, that's what it means. We are determined. You know, when I was, I, I was raised by a Southern mother, a mother from the South. And even as a adult, my mother would look at me when I was doing something that didn't represent the family well. And she would want me to look at her to see her expression when she told me, I'm not playing with you. When I was misbehaving or doing something not representative of the family. And so I share it with the commanders this morning. I'm a Norma Jean Brown son. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm not playing with you. That I mean what I say when I say we're going to hold you accountable and that your behavior reflects my leadership and it reflects all of your leadership. Move, get out of the way, but we are going to uphold the nobility of this profession. We're going to reveal our leadership and we will be accountable to the Chicagoans that deserve a department that they can be proud of. That this conduct is not representative, but if it's not, let's do something about it. Let's just quit talking about they're good officers, that we did a good job, and that these are few bad apples. Let's now be the good cops who hold the bad cops accountable by rooting them out of this profession, period. No question mark, no gray area. This kind of conduct means if you sleep during a riot, what do you do on a regular shift when there's no riot? What, what are you doing when there's no crisis? And what makes you comfortable enough that supervisors won't hold you accountable? That means sergeants, lieutenants, commanders, chiefs, deputy chiefs need to step up or step out. I'm not playing. Good afternoon. I'm Anthony Riccio. I'm the first deputy superintendent. Um, you notice I'm up here with no notes, uh, no script, because I don't need to script this. This is indefensible. What we saw there is absolutely indefensible. And I'll share with you a story. So I was out there, as was Chief Waller, as was the rest of the department. And the same time that these 13 officers were popping popcorn, taking a nap, relaxing inside this office, I was standing shoulder to shoulder with hundreds of other officers on State Street as we got pelted with rocks from rioters. I was hitting the leg. The officer standing next to me, part of my security detail, was hitting the head, hitting the helmet. Fortunately, he had his helmet on by the rocks. And that's occurring at the same time while these guys are inside having popcorn and making a pot of coffee. It is completely indefensible. And I'm the first one to jump up and, and defend officers. When, when I think they've done something right and they're improperly accused, I will defend them 100% of the time and they know it. This is indefensible. Um, there was a commander out there with me, the commander of the 24th district. She had lost her helmet when she was engaged with some of the protesters. And she stood there with no helmet, no face protection, as they were throwing rocks at her. And I finally had to tell her to go behind a protective barrier because the rocks were being, big rocks being thrown at us, being whizzed at us. And I had to pull her off the line and put her in a protected area. That's all going on the same time these 13 guys are making popcorn, taking a nap on a couch, and drinking a pot of coffee. So it is absolutely indefensible. 
I agree completely with the mayor and with the superintendent that it has to be addressed and it has to be addressed firmly. They didn't just let down the cit citizens of the city. They didn't just let down the people in that community, and they did. They also let down their fellow officers who are on the street fighting that battle to try to keep the city safe and to, to stop it from burning. We had 120 officers injured that night that they sat there. We had 167 vehicles damaged or completely destroyed the night these officers sat there, and countless businesses damaged and looted the same time that these officers sat there. So we're going to identify the officers involved, and there's going to be sure and swift discipline. Absolutely, there needs to be. And, um, and we're going to address it, and we're going to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. Because as I said initially, it is absolutely indefensible. I invite Chief Waller. Ms. Burks. I just want to say, now I've been a policeman for 34 years, and I've never been as embarrassed as I am right now. Uh, as I first said, uh, out there all day, all night, to the early morning, uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with the officers, uh, all the things that we saw, I'm not even going to go through that. And it seems like as that, that tarnishes, this incident tarnishes all those, all those acts and those works that those officers did. Um, to say I'm angry, disgusted, it doesn't really express, it can't begin to express how I feel. Um, I've never seen anything like this in my 34 years. Um, these officers did nothing to help their fellow officers. They did nothing to help these citizens. I know that mall, uh, I've known the congressman, uh, did nothing to help anyone in, that, in those instances. Stood by and just did nothing. Uh, the, their supervisors should be even held to a higher and will be held to a higher standard. They failed to live up to the standard, the integrity that we have as a policeman on that day, in that instance. We don't want to smear all the good work, but how can we not look at this and say this is something that must be widespread and we have to address it, as the first said. To continue to work hard, every day uh, is what we're going to continue to do. We're not going to give up this fight. Uh, we're going to continue to build. We're going to address this instance, identify these officers, identify those supervisors, and we're going to continue to get through these challenging uh, times. We cannot allow this attitude to exist within our department. We can't allow uh, all the good works that officers have done to be smeared by, by these, this incident, but we still have to address it. We must address this. It must be something that we continue to uh, look for and make sure that we address these, these type of incidents. I'm just going to close by saying I, I feel that these officers, uh, I've always been an uh, advocate for officers, uh, for the good works that they do. This, this just cannot be uh, pushed aside. It cannot be handled gently. Um, and, and they let the entire city and the department down. So. We'll take your questions at this time. Mayor, thank you. Can we go over just a couple of the details of the timetable, first mm -hmm. of all? Was the office burglarized by someone else? Yes. And so <clears throat> so my, let me just, if I can, recap for you. My understanding from con the congressman is the looting in that particular plaza started, uh, but I believe, much earlier in the day, um, late morning at the latest, and it carried on throughout the day. I believe that the videotape, and again, we're still going through the details, but the videotape, I believe, picks up at about uh, 1 a.m. And my understanding is that the officers were there four or five hours, possibly longer. And you'll see when you're able to, when we're able to get the video fully downloaded and processed, um, that they came in and in and out. It was a small core group initially, and then at its height, it was about 13 um, officers, three um, white shirts, supervisors, um, and 10 or other officers. And so this was Sunday, May 31st. So this was actually, um, no, Monday, May, uh, June 1st. 
Ha okay, Monday, June 1st. And right. when you say white shirts, do you know yet what, what rank? Uh, we, we do not yet, um, but that work is ongoing. The congressman was generous enough with his um, uh, chief uh, to come down and show us the videotape uh, last evening. Um, after that, the work started uh, through um, uh, Chief uh, Kono to, uh, of IAD to start the process of identification, and that work is ongoing. Has anyone been identified? Um, there's been tentative identifications, but I don't want to go any further until we know for certain. But here's what I'll also say. Can we uh, put up the photo of the large group shot? You know who you are. You know what you did. Don't make us come find you. Come in, identify yourselves, but we will find you. What do you hope happens to these officers? Well, clearly, I believe that they tarnish the badge. Everything that the um, command staff members have said. You know, I asked last night when we were all assembled looking at these pictures and videos, is there anything that could even remotely be defensible here? And to a person, each one said no. You know, as you heard, looting was going on, buildings were being burned, officers were on the front lines truly taking a beating with rocks and bottles and pipes, and these guys were lounging in a congressman's office. Let's not lose sight of that. The utter contempt and disrespect on so many levels is almost hard to fathom. When Congressman Rush first called me and we spoke, and he started describing what we then saw, I had to stop and ask him a couple times if what he said was correct, because it's almost inconceivable in the middle of what was going on that late night and into the early morning hours, where looting continued till, uh, till Monday morning, and having started Saturday night. It's inconceivable. Look at this guy sleeping on a congressman's couch, popping popcorn. You can see one of the popcorn bags right there in the image. It's Should just, they be fired? <clears throat> I believe that we should take the strongest possible action. We don't know all the details, it's still very much young, but the strongest possible action that we can take should be taken. The and particularly, excuse me, particularly with the supervisors. You know, as Superintendent Assey, the question which is appropriate, these officers clearly felt like they were untouchable that there would be no accountability. And why not when the bosses, the white shirts, are in the room with them? We got a, we got a problem that we have to solve with all degree of urgency. Do you know what district the officers are from? We don't at this point. Um, as you know, um, because of what was going on in the south and the west sides that Sunday, officers were pulled from all over the city and then deployed to the south and the west side. So the work of identifying them through those assignment sheets, through um, the GPS on vehicles, that work is ongoing. Could they face a crime themselves? It's a question that we're asking, and we'll certainly make sure that this is um, given scrutiny um, by the state's attorney and by the U.S. attorney. Alderman Dell, is this your ward as well? Could we hear from you about this? I just wonder what the residents, when mm -hmm. folks see this, what will folks, what will people in your community, what will they say? Well, first I want to thank uh, Congressman Rush for reaching out to me and, and giving me the call and sharing the tape with the mayor. I definitely thank the mayor for her swift action on on our behalf. Um, this was a total dereliction of their duty. And uh, with the looting that occurred in this mall, literally almost every store was looted from health centers to credit unions. 
uh, to retail stores, to, li to a liquor store. Um, we are appalled when we see this because our expectation is that the police are there to serve and protect. And in this case, sitting on your butt, eating popcorn, drinking coffee, and laying around uh, doesn't do the community any good. Alderman Telfella, are you here as well to speak out on, the, on what has happened? Are you, uh, I, I should know this, whether you are uh, the police and fire uh, chairman, I'm not quite sure, but I wonder, yes, I just wondered if you wanted to weigh in as well. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for inviting me to the uh, press conference here, as well as uh, Superintendent um, Mayor and uh, the Superintendent's command staff. Um, I agree with every single word that was said today. Uh, if I could just take a quick second. Um, I was not going to speak, uh, but this is something that I keep on my phone, especially lately, because it's something that meant a lot to me. It says the motto, we serve and protect, states the essential purpose of the Chicago Police Department. The department, the department serves the citizens of the city of Chicago by performing the law enforcement function in a professional manner. And it is to these citizens that it is ultimately responsible. That means a lot to thousands of police officers that we have on the Chicago Police Department. Unfortunately, the 13 that you see in front of you on these video monitors, this motto of we serve and protect means nothing, absolutely nothing to them. Those that have honorably served this department in the past and those that will serve it in the future needs to make sure that this is in, embedded in their thoughts every single day that they walk outside the door to serve this great city. They owe a responsibility and an obligation, not only to the officers that they serve with, not only to their families that they're working very hard for, but they owe that responsibility to the citizens first in the city of Chicago, to the business owners, that set up their shops in the city of Chicago, to the seniors that reside in the city of Chicago, because we rely on them. We rely on just service. And when we can't get it, this is what happens. The mayor didn't mention that there were deaths, quite a few deaths That's right. over the weekend. And I would hate to see that a death occurred in that area where these officers felt it was more important for them to take a nap that it was more important for them to eat a bag of popcorn, or that it was more important for them to get a cup of coffee. Again, I say that this responsibility of performing their duties in a professional manner is their first priority as a police officer. I said this morning, and I'll, I'll be very brief, I said this morning that since the 1830s, the concept of policing and the principles of policing have never changed. The purpose of a police department in our society is still the same. In the hundreds of years that police departments have served the cities throughout this country and throughout the world, that concept remains untrained. It's the techniques that's being used to perform those, uh, those principal functions that is what's changed over the years. We gotta get back. Our police department has to get back to understanding what the core principles of policing means. And so I stand with the mayor and the superintendent and his command staff in making sure that swift dif um, the discipline is swift in this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, was there any delay? I know you didn't see this until yesterday, but because this happened, uh, why so many days before we're all aware now of this? Well, I'll, I'll let the, the congressman speak to that, but um, I think what happened is they were simply trying to take stock of what happened. And really, uh, this is a um, campaign office. My understanding is it had been shut down after the primary. Um, his congressman staff had dutifully been out there at multiple times that day, saw that it was broken up, uh, broken into, but of course never would have conceived what they ended up seeing. And then when they did look at the video and saw the looters, but then saw what we now know, that's when um, they decided to act. But I, I think it was just everybody has felt 
incredibly overwhelmed over these last couple of weeks, Congressman. Mayor, let me just say, uh, I didn't want to share this with us. It's kind of personal, but on that very day, earlier than that day, I was called to the University of Chicago Hospital. My younger, youngest sister, Judy, passed that very day. And so my family and I had to take some time to process all of that. that was the priority for my family and for myself. So that is the primary reason that I hesitated when they laid in sharing this video with the mayor. But notwithstanding the other laying, within a matter of a couple of hours, after she laid eyes on that video, she swung into action. And I just want to tell all the citizens of this great city, line up behind this mayor. Get behind our mayor. She has the right stuff. She will make a difference in this city. And she needs our absolute commitment to work with her to right the tremendous wrongs that have existed in this city for decades. With the police department in the forefront of that, Let's get behind this courageous, dedicated, committed mayor who can bring us to a higher level and make Chicago really, instead of being the laughing stock of the nation, she can make this city the wonder of the world. And I believe in her. Thank you, Congressman. Mayor, do you, people, uh, several questions that have been given to me by other reporters. Do you believe it will be easy or difficult to get the state uh, to license police officers through the legislature? Well, it's not going to be easy. Um, I expect a significant uh, amount of opposition um, from police unions. But I think we're at a moment where the things that we felt like were impossible that politically just weren't feasible. I think we're in a moment where we have the opportunity to make this happen. And look, even when it may be difficult, if it's right and righteous, we must act. And this is right. And I think there's far more that we will do. You know, my staff will blanch when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. One of the things that continuously troubles me is thinking about John Burge. John Burge was fired by the police board in 1993. John Burge caused immeasurable harm to so many people. Even if you calculated the dollars, the city's probably spent about $200 million and counting on misconduct cases related to John George and his midnight crew. He was prosecuted and found guilty by Pat Fitzgerald's U.S. Attorney's Office and went to federal prison. He got out of prison, and he lived a number of years thereafter. And every minute, he enjoyed his police pension. There's nothing right about that. That's offensive. And so we've got to address that issue as well. 
The Southside Weekly is asking that $10 million from the CARES Act is going for violence prevention. Mm -hmm. Can you promise that none of it will go to CPD? It, it's $10 million on top of the six-plus that we already committed. That is going to um, local organizations uh, to aid in uh, violence prevention. Uh, the B Block Club is asking about the budget as well. Chicago's budget, 40% goes to policing. Mm -hmm. Do you plan on reducing that number? Well, look, th this, this issue of defunding the police, when I hear that, what I hear is people rightfully offended by the fact that we have not invested enough in communities. And I've been very clear about this. I ran on this. I like to think I got elected because I ran on this. We have to bring resources and investments to neighborhoods and communities that have been without an ounce of investment for decades. And I won't go on and recount the things that we've already done, but I am committed to making sure that we change that history so that we are investing and in answering the cry and the plea of this moment, and I'm committed to doing that. I don't believe that we can survive as a city without making these kinds of critical investments. I also know, and one of the um, folks said it, I think it was Alderman Talio Farrell, on that same Sunday where the looting was happening, 17 people were murdered in our city. 17 people. I know that we have open-air drug markets where they're unbelievably lucrative, $30,000 in cash a day, and they will shoot and kill anybody to keep that territory. We need to have this discussion, but we need to have it in the full context and understanding of the time that we are in. Could you react, as well as the superintendent, would you both react to the Fraternal Order of Police president saying that he could expel members who kneel in solidarity with protesters while in uniform? You know what? Um, there will be a reckoning for the FOP, and I think that moment is now, and that's what I'll say about that. Superintendent, superintendent would you weigh in as well? <clears throat> It's just hard to take those kinds of comments uh, serious uh, as we deal with um, COVID environment, historically high violent crime, and now misconduct uh, as it relates to civil unrest. H how does that bubble up to the most important thing to comment on? It, it, it's, it's not, I answer my own question, it's not as important as the deal, what we're dealing with and I won't dignify it with an answer. I, and I do have, okay, one other one uh, from my colleague, Charlie Wojciechowski. There has been a wrongful police raid lawsuit, Superintendent, that was filed today. Um, the Lyons family, it was a late February raid. Uh, any chance of getting a reaction from you about that wrongful raid? I'll review that investigation and, and we'll either put out a statement or we'll uh, you'll stand by the statement we've put out on it already. Thank you. Thank you. And then. Thank you, Mayor. You may have you have seen this as well. There's a CTA viral video. Have you seen it? Of I have. A CTA employee uh, slam slamming someone. Yes. Obviously, you see just a bit of it. Yeah. I you don't know what might have happened before or after. Or any reaction to that video? I I saw it. It's incredibly disturbing, to say the least. Um, both uh, the physical conduct of somebody who looks like they're a CTA employee the words that were spoken. Um, I can tell you that uh, President Carter of the CTA is very well aware of it. Um, there's an active investigation ongoing to identify uh, the person who looks like a CTA employee and really understand the circumstances in which that happened. Right now, the video is out there. We don't know exactly, um, as I came in here, even when it happened. It looks like it may have been recently, um, but um, the CTA is actively working uh, to um, understand the circumstances, identify the officer or the, uh, uh, the employee, and if it is truly a CTA employee, I'm confident uh, that President Carter will take uh, the right action uh, in addressing that employee's conduct, which is clearly unacceptable. 
Thank you, Mayor. Thank, Thank you, Marianne. You. Thank you.